Okay, so uh, it's great to see you, everyone, and thank you for coming. Today, I will be presenting my dissertation, and the title is Enhancing Safety, Efficiency, and Resilience in Advanced Air Mobility Through Geofencing, Contingency Landing Management, and Optimized Network Strategies. For friends and families here, I, I really hope this presentation shows you some of our exciting works that we have done, and also uh, show you the exciting future that's waiting for us. So uh, our research is all about advanced air mobility. It's called AAM. Many people started getting to know about this, but I still find it important to start with a formal definition. So FAA, uh, which is a Federal Aviation Administration, they defines AAM as a new aerospace sector technology that will be integrated into our life. And what are the applications? The applications are public services like flying taxi and cargo delivery. And the uh, pictures in here shows uh, some of the AAM companies that are making their prototypes. And there are about, about 200 companies in the world that are developing these AAM vehicles. So uh, why all these companies so interested in making AAM? And the reasons are because uh, AAM will reduce congestion and save time. And also because it's running by the electric power, it can produce lower emissions. And, and because we are developing AAM infrastructure, it will be stimulating the economic growth. And I wanna show you a small uh, video clip that shows how in the future, maybe in five years from now, will be looking like when people are riding AAM vehicles. So this shows in a Manhattan city area, downtown heliport uh, to JFK airport. You can see a uh, car, it takes about 49 minutes and then AM vehicle takes seven minutes, which is seven times faster than a car to travel. So uh, because of many of these reasons, AM has been rapidly developing and uh, many different market studies have done in here that shows uh, basically say uh, the growth will be, market growth will be billions of dollars in the U.S. alone. And also some other studies shows that uh, in by 2030, there will be AM vehicles that will be operating up to 10 times more vehicles than what we see major airlines do. So these are exciting news, especially for those of us who, who have been dreaming about flying taxis like myself. But there are lots of challenges and uh, challenges that we must think about. So for these reasons, NASA and CSR, they both came up with the key five areas of technology that must be addressed and researched. And throughout my PhD, uh, our research has been focused on three of these five areas. And those are individual vehicle management. Uh, uh, in here, we, we use geofencing. I, I will talk about what geofencing is in a later slide. We'll be using geofencing flight planning for low altitude urban environment. And we also do the geofencing sizing that makes sure the volume of the geofence is optimized. And then we worked on in chapter five, we worked on in case when the vehicle has a system failures, then how can we react to it? And then how can we find the contingency solutions? And then we worked on uh, chapter six, which is an aerospace system design and finding out what are the uh, optimal ways of designing the network. Because of a limited amount of time, uh, I won't be able to cover all the chapters here. So I'll be skipping chapter two, three, and four, and then focus on the remaining chapter five and six. But I still want to just briefly summarize to you what are the chapters that we worked on. So in our chapter two, uh, we wanted to answer a question how can we generate safe and efficient flight plans for low altitude urban airspace? So I wanna show you a figure here. Uh, in the future, there will be air ambulances flying in the sky, in the urban terrain, urban sky. And then there will be also lots of different obstacles and other vehicles flying as well. And some of the obstacles are like this construction crane that will be moving around. So uh, the way we have to think about how to make sure these planes are coordinated also how can they are doing a planning, pest planning safely. And the way we approached it was 
by using geofencing, uh, which is uh, 3D, you can think of it as a 3D virtual uh, barriers that's wrapping around uh, flight trajectory and also the obstacles. And then by using different types of geofencing, we can do strategic deconfliction of the flight plan and find the solutions. And this is how it looks like when we use our algorithms to generate the safe and efficient flight planning in the Manhattan city area. And this is also an example that shows uh, first come, first serve, strategic deconfliction of two UAS. Then uh, our chapter three and four answers a question, what is the optimal geofence sizing for AM vehicles? So uh, there will be lots of AM vehicles flying in the future. So the challenge for us is to, uh, how can we scale the AM operations safely? NASA and Cesar both believes geofencing is one of the key technologies for AM operations, but yet there is uh, no clear uh, agreement about what is the right geofencing sizing. So uh, this, this might be what the future will look like when we uh, have AM operations flying. So lots of them will be flying and it will not be in just one city, but it will be in many different cities like this. So the airspace will be crowded and the sizing of geofencing for vehicles will become very important. If the geofence is too big, then airspace will be wasted. But if the geofence is too small, then a vehicle might be violating the boundary of the geofence. So we wanted to answer this question of sizing the geofence by finding how can we find statistically finding and guaranteeing the safety of the, of the uh, flight and also minimizing the geofence volume. And we do this by modeling vehicle, AM vehicle, using guidance, navigation, and control, and also combining uh, computational fluid dynamics that models the wind characteristics in the urban city. And this figure shows how it looks like. So it finds the minimum geofence sizing that guarantees that our vehicle will be inside of this geofence with 99% confidence. And this is the animation that shows uh, our AM vehicle that is flying inside this, this optimal geofence along the flight path. So then, now, uh, this is the outline of the presentation, and for the remaining time, I will be focusing on Chapter 5, Chapter 6, and the conclusion. Okay, so this is Chapter 5, which answers the question, uh, how to make sure AM vehicles find and select a safe landing site in case it has system failures. And I would like to quote what Professor Atkins, my advisor, taught me. There is no reason to discover in an emergency what you can plan and map before flight. Okay, so I wanna start with a market study. So market study has shown us that safety is the top concern of AM vehicle uh, operations. So people are concerned about increasing number of vehicles that will be flying overhead. So we need to, we need to make sure that each AM vehicle is capable of finding and selecting and also, also flying to the safe landing site in case when the vehicle needs to do. And I wanna relate this by showing a video of my first time sitting in Cessna airplane and my own experience of uh, emergency landing because of uh, electric failures. So, so here, it was a beautiful evening a couple of years ago and we flew over Detroit sky and then our avionic system shut down because of electric failures. Our pilot, uh, our pilot was a Professor Atkins' husband. He is a veteran pilot, and we were lucky because we were able to find the local airport to land. And uh, so, in a, in a normal condition, the avionics looks like this. But as you can see here, we basically lost the electric avionics in here. And uh, but we we were able to land safely because the engine was not affected by that. And the reason why I show you this is not to scare us uh, from using AAM, but rather we, we want to point out that uh, even after safety redundancies, components may fail. And because of the large number of AAM operations in the future and pilots will not be as trained, so there might be system failure and pilots might start panicking and pilots might not even have time to react to it. 
So this is why we may need to have autonomy and the contingency management system uh, along uh, incorporating uh, human factors as well. So with that in mind, uh, our research was about assured contingency landing management. We call this ACLM. So what it does is uh, it finds optimal landing options for vehicles that has some system failures using a pre-analyzed and real-time flight data. And our runtime is very quick. It takes about a couple milliseconds to generate the solution, much faster than what human pilots can do. And then we do have uh, this customizable sampling rate for our ACLM, and then it integrates the vehicle system so that we can adjust the custom uh, sampling rate for the ACLM. And before, before I jump into more details, uh, these are the contributions and innovations. So as for our contributions, we integrated past planning and mathematically provable controllability and reachability logic into the ACLM architecture. And also we incorporated a categorized landing site database and then have a simulation for in a realistic environment model. And our innovations are uh, developing ACLM architecture that has a real time online and offline contingency management, as well as implementing a flight planning switch me mechanism uh, that's integrating uh, controllability and reachability for the vehicle status. Okay, so uh, this is how it looks like the inside of ACLM. There are mainly uh, six main functions in here, and I will just show you what they are briefly, and then in later slide, I will show you how, how they actually look like and uh, the state flow looks like. So offline flight planning, what does it is uh, it constructs the contingency flight plans for the vehicle, and then CNR watchdog, it checks the vehicle health condition and status for us. And then landing strategy selector, what it does is when uh, we have a system failure in our vehicle, then it executes the uh, pre-computed emergency landing plans based on the uh, vehicle status that's checked by the CNR, CNR watchdog. And then we have online flight planner. Uh, what it does is in case we can't use any offline flight planning database, then we in a real time generate the new flight plans based on uh, the landing site that has a little bit more risk than the uh, pre-stored database, but we use this to generate optimal conflict-free path. And we then we have a selector. Um, what it does is uh, it checks. So our ACLM takes some time to calculate the solution and our selector is used to find and decide whether to continue flying the vehicle or holding the position while ACLM is generating the solution. And then we have this uh, flight termination, which is terminating ACLM and vehicle system in case there, in case the vehicle is uncontrollable, completely unable to be controlled, and or if there's no place to land, and then it executes the, the system, uh, terminate the system by uh, popping up the parachutes. Okay, so I will go a little deeper into each thread and to show you how the system looks like. So this is the offline flight planning thread. So what it does is it constructs a, a mission specific contingency, contingency pre-flight database. And then we categorize it into a minimum risk and moderate risk landing site near, near each of the flight plans uh, approximate footprint. This shows based on the nominal conditions of battery health, these are the areas the vehicle can reach. So we find and store the landing site based on this, these areas. And then uh, this figure shows an example of uh, Manhattan city area uh, that has minimum risk landing site, which you can see in here as a green circles in here and moderate risk landing site, which are shown in the red circle. Okay, then the next thread is controllability and reachability watchdog. So what it does is it use to check a vehicle's status and the health. So we use a positive controllability and energy consumption based reachability to find out uh, whether uh, what's the vehicle health. So uh, I want to show you this figure in here. So imagine uh, there are two octocopter having eight propellers, but their propeller rotation directions are different in here and here. So depending on their configurations, the location of rotor failure 
will have a different outcomes. So in here, uh, we have this X mark indicating uh, which combinations of two rotor failures will make this vehicle become uncontrollable for us. So our system uses the positive controllability and reachability to check in our customized sampling rate to continue checking the health of the vehicle. Okay, then the next one is the landing strategy selector. So uh, what it does is it uses this uh, offline flight plan database and then uh, executes the emergency landing flight plan when the system requires immediate landing. Uh, we, use a, we use a minimum risk landing site as a priority in this landing strategy selector. And this is how it looks like when we visualize it. So uh, there are approximate footprint, which you can see in here as these dashed green circles. And these, uh, these blue dots are the locations where we can land uh, by, uh, by storing this predefined landing site and then generate the flight plans for this. And then uh, as I said before, uh, in case there are cases, we might not be able to find any feasible solutions from the pre-stored database. So in that case, we have to use uh, real online flight planning and then we are using uh, positive, uh, we are using a forward reachability, which checks the real-time flight plans flight plans, whether they can reach the landing site destination. And then uh, this is what it looks like when you visually see it. So this is a location where when the vehicle triggers is emergency, and then it checks the, in real time, what are the moderate risk landing site out there? And then you find the minimum risk landing site. And this reachability does change based on the vehicle speed and also based on the capacity capacities of the batteries. And the next one uh, is, this one is called uh, continue hold selector. Uh, as I explained before, uh, uh, ACLM takes about a couple of milliseconds to generate the solutions, but uh, depending on the situations, it might take actually longer time than that. So we want to make sure our system is able to select between continue flying the path or holding this location of the uh, position of the vehicle. And the cost function for selecting continue or holding is shown in here. Uh, the superscript I is for holding or continuing. And then we have a population density, air traffic density, and uh, proximity to moderate risk landing site. They are all incorporated into this cost function. And then uh, we do have this uh, flight termination thread, which is the last thread in the ACLM that's running. So, uh, what, what, what it does is basically when we reach an uncontrollable state or when when there's no contingency landing file, landing place we can find, it triggers this, but it does it by checking the vehicle's uh, vehicle's condition and then it, it, it pop up the parachute in the right time based on this attitude rate and, and attitude rate and attitude. Yeah. So uh, with our ACLM, then we designed hexacopter system and then incorporate this to uh, to test our simulations. Uh, and in here, we have a two hexacopter weights. One is a lighter weight hexacopter and one is a heavier weight hexacopter. And uh, this shows the sampling rate of the controller and our ACLM and the vehicle parameters and what are the average current draw for both uh, hexacopter system uh, when it has a nominal conditions and when rotor fails. And this shows, uh, this tables and figures shows a process of obtaining the landing site database and the Monte Carlo simulation parameters, as well as the weights that we use to calculate the landing sites. So uh, for our simulation, uh, we had these four different categories. Uh, one is the nominal condition where battery doesn't have any uh, malfunctioning happening and 10% degradation, 15% degradation, and 50% battery degradations. And then uh, the map in here shows an example of a nominal flight plan flying in Manhattan City for a package delivering hexacopter. And we had uh, three different operation failure cases. So a single rotor failure and single battery degradation with these four different uh, battery percentage and then combination of both one and two happening at the same time. And then we ran uh, about 
10,400 Monte Carlo simulations for each lighter weight and heavier weight hexacopter randomly triggering these different types of uh, uh, anomaly systems. And this is what it looks like uh, for a heavier weight hexacopter that's having an in-flight single rotor failure case. So uh, I want to point out to you that our he heavier weight hexacopter is designed uh, such a way uh, that when it loses one single rotor, then it doesn't have enough thrust to maintain its altitude at the same time controlling the attitude. So basically, uh, as you can see here, when it start losing is it start losing its rotor, and then it can't maintain its altitude to to fly, but then it can still be able to follow the directions. And this shows how much altitude we are losing per second, and then. Uh, our ACLM then instantly identifies and select a safe landing site for this vehicle for us. And this shows an example uh, that shows for heavier weight hexacopter and lighter weight hexacopter. And we can see the differences in here. So uh, this RLS, LLSS is uh, offline flight planning solutions. And our online FP is for online flight planning solutions. And FT stands for flight termination cases. And so because heavier weight hexacopter uh, cannot really maintain its altitude, the performance of finding which solution offline or online does change uh, is different from the lighter weight hexacopter. And then this shows an example of uh, runtime uh, for each of the thread. As you can see, uh, uh, CNR watchdog, offline fly, fly planning, online flight planning, uh, their times are in, in milliseconds. Okay, so then uh, now moving into chapter six, this is about answering the question, how to optimize AAM traffic management in centralized and distributed settings. So uh, there was another interesting study done and it was about reasons for using AAM vehicle and saving time was the primary motivations in uh, many different countries that are developing AAM. And as we talked before, there will be uh, lots of AM vehicles flying in the future. And the average AM flight time is expected to be less than 20 minutes. And uh, so because of a large number of AM vehicles that will be flying and they will be flying a short travel time, the aerospace operation will be looking very different from what we see. So vehicles will be vertically taking off and vertically landing and the traveling and they will be traveling in a lower altitude so because of a different ecosystem out there for aam uh, many uh, governments companies and laboratories laboratories they worked on making a, a concept of operations for new aerospace designs and uh, this slide shows you uh, summarizes some of the con ops by government agencies and the uh, key takeaways are uh, all of them are utilizing geofencing and also they use a uh, structure something called corridor for aerospace design. I will show you what this is in the later slide. And, and this slide shows you uh, a con concept of operation by uh, private companies. And as we can see again, uh, they are using geofencing and also they are also using corridors or some variation of corridors. And one key difference we found was a uh, few companies are considering a decentralized traffic management system. Okay, so this is uh, what, it, uh, what the flight corridor looks like. So it's a basically this highway in the sky where vehicles will be flying, sometimes flying in a queue or flying in a different speed. So this uh, structure-wise, we can simplify and uh, simplify the structures of the airspace. And then uh, the right figure shows us uh, what FAA, Federal Aviation Administration, uh, designed for this AEM architecture. So this shows uh, some of the highlights for this figure is there will be UAM AM operators, which makes the AM vehicles, and they will be flying the vehicles, and there will be a service gateway uh, that's done by FAA, and there's something called PSUs. Uh, this is this is a provider of services for UAM, 
And what it does is basically it does the AEM traffic management for these vehicles. So uh, uh, before I jump into the details, I want to show you the contributions and innovations of our work. So as for the contributions, uh, we integrated aerospace sectorization, corridor-based route planning, and AM network management. I will, I will explain to you what this actually means in a later slide. And then we also incorporated different constraints uh, out there. A vehicle has a constraint, and there are infrastructure constraints and operation constraints. And our innovations are we developed the we formulated and developed the centralized AEM strategic traffic management, and also we developed a bi-level optimization based distributed AEM traffic management. Okay, so uh, we want to explain our work by addressing three key questions and showing the process of how we are solving them holistically. And the first question is. Um, uh, how, how should urban airspace be divided so that the local traffic managers, PSUs, can handle AAM effectively? So uh, this is how the U.S. airspace looks like. Uh, they are uh, partitioned by geographical regions in here. And the reason for that is because uh, we want to reduce the controller's workload and also want to, have an, want to have an efficient coordination of the airplanes that's transitioning from one region to other regions. And in the context of AM operation, PSU does the traffic management for us, but this sectorization is still important. Uh, efficient aerospace sectorization will, will prevent overburdening each PSUs and also making sure that efficient traffic handling can be done among those different sectors. And this is an example that shows maybe a potential vertical locations for Florida. There are many different uh, vertical ports in different cities out there. And this shows you that geographical reasons are important. And also uh, different vertical ports may have different numbers of different numbers of a touchdown and lift up uh, capacities and they might have a different number of parking spaces. So our aerospace sectorization for AM vehicle uh, should be reflecting these parameters to prevent the congestion for uh, in the individual PSUs. So uh, once the PSU aerospace sectorization is done, then we need to think about next question, which is then how can we plan the AM route? Thinking about uh, different capacities, uh, different uh, limits out there. So uh, in here, I want to show you, as I said before, uh, each of the bird ports, this is a place where vehicle will be landing and taking off, and we'll have a finite spaces for them to take off and land. And also uh, the corridor will have a fixed volume so that uh, there are limits of how many vehicles can travel through. And also, uh, we have a corridor transition, which is basically a point where uh, corridors are connected and sharing the space. So uh, there might be some cases where vehicles might, in, in worst case scenario, if we don't do the traffic management correctly, they will be colliding because they are sharing the routes in here. So uh, these are some of the consideration we have to think about for answering these questions. And then... Uh, uh, next question is, okay, then we finished making aerospace sectorization and then we finished making route planning for the vehicle. But then imagine a vehicle that, that is passing through a different aerospace regions controlled by different PSUs. Then uh, we have, if we do not coordinate the communications among the different PSUs, the uh, one solution done by one AAM PSU may affect adjacent PSUs because every PSU, they want to optimize their own traffic in their own region. So one of the simple way of doing it is by lowering the traffic, by pushing all the vehicles that's moving out of these regions as fast as it can. And then by pushing the vehicles out too fast, other regions will be congested more. So there will be some kind of you know, competition among the PSUs if we do not coordinate, if we do not have this collaboration among the PSUs. So we'll answer these questions as well. 
Okay, so uh, uh, with those questions in mind, uh, now we will solve the problem holistically. And the first one is the uh, uh, PSU airspace sectorization. And I will show you in here how it can be done visually. So uh, imagine these circles are vertiports where vehicle will land and take off. And these lines are edges. Uh, this is the corridor that's connecting the vertiports. And then each of the board ports will have a different characteristics, a different number of board port capacities, and also geographically have a different populations in that town. So the way we approach is we use a community detection algorithm to find out and grouping board ports that have a similar properties in terms of a distance and in terms of a different uh, uh, characteristics of the board ports. And then uh, we apply Voronoi diagram, which does the geographical partitioning of the area. And then combining these two, we can have our aerospace uh, sectorization that's geographically partitioning uh, the sectors based on uh, similarities of the vertical ports. So uh, this, these are the actual specific parameters to, to group the vertical ports that have a similar properties. And uh, so uh, basically there are, um, normalized distance between the vertical ports and we have a connectivity which is basically uh, how many number of corridors are connected to each vertical ports so uh, looking at this uh, vertical port 13 for example we have a one two three four five six seven eight nine corridors are connecting to it so we want to compare how many corridors are connected to each of the vertical ports and then see the similarity among them and then population similarity score and vertical port capacity similarity factors are comparing how similar the population of the town and, uh, and the vertical port capacities are. And then we normalize these parameters to find out the sectorizations. And then once the aerospace sectorization is done, then we design the corridor. And the way we do this is um, uh, we want to think about uh, uh, having a multi-lanes to, to have a different speed for AEM traffic. And we also have this maximum throughput capacity for each of the corridor. So it limits how many vehicles can travel through each corridor. And then we conceptually design our corridor as a bi-directional vertical layering structure so that vehicles that's traveling, uh, passing through these vertical ports can go fast speed in the top lane and then uh, vehicles that need to land in this vertical port can reduce their speed as it's uh, reducing the altitude and slow down. So this is how we conceptually design our corridors. And then uh, the next thing is now, how can we do the pass planning? Uh, we think uh, we think about uh, two different pass planning options for AM flight missions, and then compare their performances. The, the first one is uh, shortest distance flight route. So basically this is the shortest traveling pass from the, uh, from the uh, departure to destination. And another route option that we consider is using this. So what it is, is, a, is a, we call it customized uh, weight and optimized route. So you can see there are potentially congested regions which shown in this uh, gray shaded area. And our this optimized, customized weight path does try to avoid this potentially congested area to reach the destination. And we'll compare these things in the later slide, how they actually perform. And then now I want to talk about spatial conflicts, conflict detection and the resolution. So uh, uh, some of the corridors, uh, some of the corridor segments will be spatially sharing, and there are seven different types that can occur between uh, each pair of conflicted AM flats. And, and to briefly explain, uh, for example, uh, one case is this uh, spatial conflict types one and two. So what they are basically is uh, one AM vehicle is passing through this birdie port and another vehicle is at the same time taking off or land at the birdie ports. And this, this is the reason where we have a spatial conflict. And if these two AM vehicles reach the same altitude at the same time, then that means they will be hitting each other. So we want to make sure these things are taken care of in our traffic simulations. 
and then uh this is the this is the gist of how how we can do the uh strategic uh, temporal conflict resolution so uh, so there are two uh, flight corridors one is purple vehicle is following this path and this is uh, another corridor a vehicle is following this path and there this is a spatial conflicted region so vehicle needs to coordinate correctly and the way we do this is making sure one vehicle passes this region before another vehicle enters it. So if we can guarantee this can be done for every single vehicle in hundreds or thousands of vehicle simulations, all they are work operating at the same time, then we guarantee that there is a temporal deconfliction. And, and the timing for uh, timing at which timing of which vehicle enters and exit first and also what time the vehicle uh, should take off and land and also how much speed that the vehicle should be traveling are all calculated by solving the optimization. Okay, uh, then uh, once we finish aerospace sectorization and corridor design and the flight planning, then the next one is centrally centralized AM traffic management. And then we consider uh, takeoff, landing, vertical capacities and multi-lane bi-directional corridors, and also different types of vehicles. In our case, we simulate three different vehicle types in here, and uh, uh, they have different characteristics. In terms of the distance, how far they can travel, uh, lift and cruise configuration has the longest distance to travel because it has a wing configuration, and the multi-copter has the least travel distance. And in terms of the speed, Vector thrust has the highest speed because it has the mo most number of uh, propellers that will be pushing the vehicles to move forward, and the multicopter has the least. So this shows that different vehicle types have different performances, and we wanna we wanna put this in a simulation to see how they all perform. And the last one is we also wanted to include service priorities. So uh, there are three types we consider medical services, which is like delivering medical body body organs and express basically people paying more money to travel faster and regular, which is you know, uh, just regular AM operations. So ideally medical services should have the highest priority. So having a minimum delay in the travel. And with those things, uh, our objective cost is basically we want to find the uh, holistic AEM traffic management that minimize the overall departure delay and urban delay. And the way we do it is we also want to think about the fairness. So we don't want to sacrifice one AEM vehicle than other vehicles. So we don't want to say uh, one AEM vehicle, you have to wait 10 hours to fly. And other vehicles, you say we say, oh, you can leave right now. We don't want to do that. So we want to find a solution that can fairly assign all the uh, uh, timing for vehicles. And this is, I will briefly walk you through the formulation. So our objective cost has actual departure, actual arrival, and equity of assigning the departure time, which is the fairness of the vehicle's departure time, and also service priority and uh, cost ratio of airborne to departure delay. So these things are all uh, uh, formulated in the equation, and we solve this equation to find out what are the all vehicles optimal time to travel. And then for our constraints, we have a time dependent touchdown and lift off capacity, which shows uh, for different bird ports, they have a different uh, simultaneous takeoff and landing capacities. We take that into account, which has a time dependency. And then we also put corridor throughput capacity and specific vehicle specific speed constraints, and then corridor confinement. We want to make sure that vehicles are flying inside of the corridor and then uh, assigned departure time. So we, uh, in our simulation for the centralized system, we want to assign the vehicle's departure time to be not before us, uh, their scheduled departure time. So it's either at the same time each company wants to fly or maybe one, two, three, four minutes after uh, mo uh, a delay. And then we also have this temporal conflict resolution constraints.
Okay, so uh, I want to show you some demos of how our centralized AM traffic management is done. And uh, these are in here it shows the three vehicles flying in each of the flight paths, path one, path two, path three. And our optimization solution, it finds out which time, what's the time for each vehicle to depart and what's their speed. And then uh, they're driving all the way to destination without basically hitting each other. And this is an, another example. Uh, that shows uh, bi-directional uh, multi-corridor structure, which has two lanes so that vehicles are uh, adjusting their speed along the path to deconflict their solutions. Okay, so uh, then we finished sectorization, corridor design, route planning, and centralized AM traffic management. And the next one for us is how can we do distributed system? And the reason, one advantage of using distributed system is, is scalability. So in our simulation, uh, distributed optimization is actually 1.4 1. 4 times to 30 times faster for individual PSUs to generate their solutions. So this is one of the driving reasons for using this. And uh, uh, this is how it looks like. Uh, we created bi-level optimization where game theory is used as a high-level optimization. Uh, and the objective function is to uh, to have a fair and coordinated negotiations among the conflicted PSUs. And lower level optimization, we are using uh, mixed integer programming. And the objective function is finding what's the minimum overall departure and airborne, airborne delay for each PSUs. Uh, and, and the formulation wise, uh, our negotiable bargain power is defined by having these three components, which are AM traffic density, a number of transition corridors, and number of spatial conflicts. And they are normalized to find out each of PSU's negotiated bargaining power. And then we do have this uh, uh, utility function. So it's basically uh, finding out the maximum, it's doing a maximization problem with a utility function. And we named this utility function as a transition time equity function. So uh, basically what it shows us is uh, how, how much each PSU uh, feels about individual AEMs, uh, their negotiated bargain time for vehicles that's transitioning between PSUs. And then uh, this is a modified objective function and additional constraints that makes this bi-level optimization working. And uh, I want to point out to you that this negotiable bargaining power that each PSU has changes over time, changes over the operational time window. This is because uh, the demand will change over time. So, for example, uh, in the morning time when people are committing to work, people, want, people are leaving from residential area to commercial area. So there's an influx of vehicles going to the commercial sector. And in the evening time, it's the opposite. People are leaving to work to their home. So by reflecting this demand, we can have uh, this co cooperative negotiation framework among the PSU. They are they are basically incentivized to, to negotiate because this uh, bargaining power will be changing over time and, and there's no PSU that will be having a permanent advantage over others. And now the simulation wise, uh, so we simulated our traffic management using real AEM vehicles that has three different vehicle types, multi-copter, vector thrust, and lift and cruise configuration. And our map and flight operation uh, parameters are shown in here. Uh, some of them are, uh, so we simulated four hours, four hours of flight uh, operation time and uh, vehicle types all have the same number of the vehicles in the simulation and service priority types also for each vehicle, we have the same distribution. So we wanna have a regular having 50%, express having 40% and medical services 10% flying. And this is the uh, artificial map that we created. There are four PSUs in, in the region and there are 30 bird ports uh, where vehicles will be flying. Okay, so uh, these figures show how much each vehicle type and how it, how uh, and how each service priority types gets delayed in average for both centralized system and for distributed system, and we simulated for a uh, hundred fifty vehicle 
and 300 vehicle simulations. And for uh, the vehicle types, uh, as the number of vehicle increases from 150 to 300 vehicles, all types experienced more delays. And for the distributed PSU cases, multi-copter had the least delay in both ground and airborne, depart airborne delays. And for the service priority types, uh, medical operations uh, showed the least ground and airborne delay as we expected because this has the highest priority uh, compared to other vehicle types, other service priority types. And then uh, now runtime and objective costs are compared between centralized system and distributed system for both 150 flight and 350, 300 flights. And for the runtime, as the number of flight increases, distributed system performed better than centralized system. Uh, so individual PSUs were able to uh, generate the solutions 1.4 to 30 times faster than centralized system. And for the objective cost, uh, the cost remained almost the same, even though the number of vehicle increases and also uh, the decentralized system had a lower cost. So this shows some of the promising results of using distributed system because it's much faster and the uh, objective cost is actually low. And uh, now I want to I want to bring this figure again to us, uh, and this shows uh, and then show you what are the results of comparing two different route planning methods. So uh, we compare them in a distributed PSU settings, and here we have a weighted optimized and distance based pass in a different color, green and brown, and then uh, the outcome was we had some mixed outcome. Uh, weighted optimized routes actually didn't perform much better than distance-based route. And uh, it turns out that as more AM vehicles are uh, trying to avoid the congested area, the number of spatial conflicts actually end up increasing as the, all the vehicles are detouring and then causing more conflicts among them. But one thing we also found was this weighted optimized route does minimize the number of PSU transitions, which means it reduces the, reduces the uh, number of coordinations that needs to be done among the conflicted PSUs. So uh, this brings up the uh, future work and by carefully designing uh, the routes, we can further reduce the delays even more. And uh, with this, now I wanna move to conclusion and future work. So I would like to wrap up by showing a very nice video from NASA and summarize and relates our work in this video. So AM vehicles will revolutionize the transportation and we can see these geofences around the vehicles and obstacles. So our first three chapters uh, were about flight planning in low altitude urban airspace using geofences. And also we worked on finding out what's the optimal geofence sizes for the vehicle. And there are still many future works to do. Uh, some of those are how to generate more efficient geofencing algorithms and how to incorporate uh, dynamic weather conditions and how to size the geofence. Then uh, we looked at the AM traffic management. Uh, there are networks that's operating inside them, flying through the corridors, as you can see here, and vehicles are coordinated and temporarily deconflicted. So we designed our AM traffic management using uh, both centralized system and distributed system and find out our distributed system can actually have some motivations of using those things because of a, a runtime calculation. And then, uh, some of the future works are, there are lots of future works to do in here as well. Uh, one important thing to, for, for us to think about is how can we do uh, stochastic and robust AM traffic management, uh, taking into uncertainties into account.
And then lastly, uh, we did work on contingency landing management for our AM vehicles that need some contingency landing uh, management. And uh, uh, if the vehicle needs to declare emergency landing, our ACLM does check the vehicle status and then find out the landing site uh, very fast in milliseconds. And the future works are, uh, there are many future works to do in the contingency landing management. And one of the examples for us is extending our ACLM for other vehicle configurations and also using uh, different path planning algorithms as well as uh, visual sensors. And these are the conferences and journals paper uh, that we published. And now, um, as I'm finishing my dissertation, I want to take a moment to share with you about my dreams and hope to make these dreams come true. So when I was a child, I lived in a small town in Africa and I learned what a great impact engineering can have for us. For us, uh, getting clean and drinkable water was not an easy thing at the time. And I saw a, a portable water filtering device that really opened my eyes. A device that can people can carry and also filters water enough for one year. And since I was young, I loved the sky, I seeing clouds, and everything related to flying. And since then, I felt very fortunate that I was able to study aerospace engineering and come to U of M to study my PhD. And uh, really, I met incredible people out there in the schools. So these are what I really want to do as I finish my PhD. And uh, with that, I really want to take this time to thank many people who really uh, helped me, supported me, taught me. So first of all, Professor Atkins, I, I have always felt so lucky and fortunate that I met you as my advisor and really thank, thank you so much for you know, giving me a chance to do PhD and getting really great funding and also teaching me and guiding me. And it has been really a great journey for me because of you. And Professor Lee, uh, it has been a joy working with you. And thank you for being my co-advisor. It was, it, was, it was so great to work on this AM traffic management together. And Professor Sartor, it is it's, it's such an honor for me to have you as, as my dissertation committee members. Uh, I remember a couple of years ago, we had a joint research together and you were then in my qualifying exam examiners. And now you're also in my dissertation committee members. And, and I am so thankful for your feedback and guidance and showing me what are the human factors that must be done. And also, uh, also thank you so much for uh, teaching and fostering next generation engineers at U of M and congratulations really on your retirement. And Professor Panau, uh, also thank you so much for serving this dissertation committee. And uh, I do not know, I told you before, um, the favorite classes that I took at U of M are classes that you taught me, two, class, two classes that you taught me. And I get really fascinated by your research and really thank you so much for your teaching and, and guidance. And then uh, I also want to take this moment to thank my friend in the labs, Prasine and Jeremy. It was really great working with you on ACL. And without both of you, I wouldn't be able to really progress much further. I learned a lot from both of you. And Akshay, uh, it was great working with you also in the research together. And thank you for being such a great friend. You know, we, we went through lots of things together and I feel very fortunate that you are my friend together we did a PhD. And also uh, good luck on your uh, defense coming up. And also Mark, Brandon, Paul, Prince, Matt, Mia, Cosme, Hijin, Emre, Evidami, Brooke, Chris, all thank you so much. And also thank you so much for giving feedback for preparing this dissertation. Uh, and Mia, thank you for pioneering uh, geofencing work. And also uh, Ladislav, Hachun, Hejun, Billy, Adia, Minghao, Yushun, Sihang, and all of you guys too. Thank you so much for being a lab mate. And then I want to take this time to really thank Denise, our, our world best graduate coordinator. Uh, I feel very fortunate that I, I met you as my graduate coordinator and thank you so much for your support. Always, you know, your support, encouragement, and really everything. Thank you so much. And then uh, 
Collins Aerospace and NASA, Alex Nick, Stefano, Giovanni, Bushibu, Dave, and Natasha, Hanbong Baksanim, and Terry, all of you. Uh, thank you for your research collaboration, your support, teachings, and feedback, encouragement. Because of you as well, I was really able to do this research. Thank you so much. And then uh, I want to thank my family, my grandma, Bundong Sun Yosanim, and my parents and sister. Without you, I won't be here. And with your unconditional love and prayers, I was able to study and to follow the dreams. I really want to thank you all. Thank you. And I love you so much. And then for my, uh, to my friends, uh, thank you so much for the friendship and the brotherhood. And also uh, the friends we study together, work together. And uh, also for your prayers and love, uh, both from the Korean New Life Church and the Redeemer Church, I, I can feel the support from you and thank you so much. And one last thing. I really want to take this moment to thank God for blessing me and for giving me this wisdom and knowledge to pursue the studies and for shaping me and for strengthening me and for sometimes chastising me and allowing me to be a clay and a vessel for him to have the dreams for his kingdom and his name. The Lord is my shepherd and he refreshes my soul and really guides me to the right path for his name. And I thank my Lord for his protection for his love, guidance, and grace. And thank you, Lord. And with that, uh, I want to thank everyone for really coming here for your time. And really, thank you very much, everyone.